From Hollywood, it's time now for... Johnny Dollar. Good afternoon, sir. This is Phineas Crane. How are you, Mr. Crane? Highly perturbed, sir. Now, what's bothering you? My generation used to call it conscience. I want to talk to you, Mr. Dollar. Well, that's quite a change, isn't it, from your attitude last night? There have been a number of changes since last night. I can't bear the thought of that girl being imprisoned. She doesn't like it too much herself. All right, what's on your mind? Well, I'd prefer now to discuss it over the telephone. Then you'll have to hold your horses. I'm waiting here for a call from Hartford and some information from the police. It might be the same information I'm ready to give you, sir. I don't think so. You should have talked last night, Mr. Crane. I might have been willing then to make a deal of some kind. And now? No deal. I can guess what happened to the necklace. And as far as the rest of it's concerned, I never make deals on murder. <laughs> Tonight, and every weekday night, Bob Bailey in the transcribed adventures of the man with the action-packed expense account, America's fabulous freelance insurance investigator... Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. From Special Investigator Johnny Dollar, location Cranesburg, Ohio to the Home Office Tri-State Guarantee Company, Hartford, Connecticut. Assignment, the Cranesburg matter. Expense account, final page. <music> Item 13, $28.65. Phone calls to Cincinnati and Cleveland and two prepaid calls to Hartford. The wheels were spinning now, and I spent most of the day just sitting back and waiting. Toward late afternoon, Police Chief Ed Durham phoned then Hartford, and then Durham again. And finally, the three black bars dropped into place, and the payoff was jackpot. <music> Item 14, $10.50, second day's rental on hired car. I left the hotel just before dark and drove out through the north edge of town to the Crane Estate. When I'd gone out there the day before, I'd been mostly guessing, playing hunches. But this time, I knew pretty much what I wanted and just how to go about getting it. I thought the place deserted as I walked up the long arbor from the carriage house. But as I stepped out onto the terrace, I realized I was wrong. Mr. Dollar, over here. In here, please. Hurry. Why all the secrecy, Mr. Crane? I wanted to talk to you alone. I rather doubted whether I would be able to if it were known that you were here. Able to or permitted to? Well, that's what I meant, sir. Permitted. Who would stop you, Mr. Crane? Well, that, you might say, is part of the story. The story I didn't tell you last night. Why not? Why didn't you tell me? I still thought then I might be able to save things. And you don't think so now? I'm afraid not. It's too late. You know too much about it now. What were you doing in Smiley Pearl's room when I found you last night? Looking for the necklace. I told you that. Did you know then he'd been murdered? Oh, no, no, no. I wouldn't have had the nerve to go there if I had. And there wouldn't be of any use of going. That's when I realized it was all over when I heard Mr. Prell had been killed. Dishonesty is one thing, but murder is something else again. You're so right. Of course, it wasn't dishonest at first. It was all quite legal in the beginning. But not later. No, no, not later. I was against that. Not that I'm claiming any virtue for it. Probably it was just cowardice. Mr. Dollar, be as easy on her as you can. I'm afraid it won't be in my hands. I suppose not. These things are always done so impersonally by institutions created for that purpose. Rightfully, no doubt. But one occasionally wonders. There's something I wonder about sometimes, Mr. Crane. You refer to... Human greed. That's true. There's no real excuse for us, my niece and me. Reasons, yes. An inherited social position and way of life. And declining wealth to support them. We're soft people, Mr. Dollar. And when life gets hard, we, we look for a soft way out. And that usually turns out to be the hard way. She'll find it so, I imagine. For me, it doesn't really matter anymore. How did you get into... On to Smiley Prell. How did you know he was the one who robbed your son? I was just guessing. 
until you told me yesterday that he was a professional jewel thief and that he'd phoned the insurance company and claimed to have the necklace. But before that, when you were guessing, how did you know about him? What reason did you have to guess? I'd seen him hanging around the estate here twice, the week before the robbery and when I saw him again afterward, talking to his uh, uh, contact, uh, I guess you'd call it. His employer fits the facts better. I suppose so. Anyway, I put two and two together, and I followed Prowl. I found out where he lived. Did the employer know you'd done this? Oh, no, hardly. Or I doubt that I'd be sitting here talking to you. Oh, not that it matters, since you probably know more of the details than I do. All right, Uncle Phineas. That's quite enough. Melba. That was a very quiet entrance, Miss Crane. It wasn't intentional. I didn't know you were here until I heard voices. Uncle Phineas, would you mind leaving us alone? It's too late, my dear. I think time is about to run out on all of us. Aided a great deal, I presume, by some of your more senile imaginings. Mr. Dollar didn't really need any help. Please. Very well, my dear. I leave the two of you then to what I anticipate may be rather stormy. What were you doing? Pumping him? Trying to make him say things you could twist later and use against him? No, it was more a matter of humoring him, I'd say. What's the matter, Melba? A hangover from last night? I suppose you told him that, too, that I came to your hotel to see you. No, it didn't seem relevant somehow. I see. Where's your fiancé? Dean? Sure, how many have you got? Mr. Sellers is in the billiard room. Why? What do you want with him? Oh, I need just a few more facts to fill out the picture. I think he can supply them, that's all. What facts? Why have you come here? Uncle Phineas invited me. What for? He said something about wanting to clear his conscience. His mind wanders. You know that. You can't rely on anything he says. I'm not. What about the girl they arrested? Your maid, Betty? Yes, Betty. If the police are satisfied she's guilty, why aren't you? Because I was hired to find a pearl necklace that was stolen from your safe. It was insured for $20,000, remember? And I haven't found it yet. Suppose I were to withdraw the insurance claim. It's a little too late. The police would want to know why. Why? Simply because I choose to. Because I don't want any more fuss about it. It's not a loss, actually. The necklace was a gift. Oh, yes, I know. An engagement present of great sentimental value from that wealthy young philanderer, Mr. Dean Sellers, who, incidentally, is broker than you are. What? Yeah. Got a complete rundown on him from Hartford late this afternoon. I don't believe it. <laughs> it's quite a shock, I imagine. You'd say anything just to help that girl get out of jail. Ah, you got me mixed up with Sellers, haven't you? He's the one who rallied to her defense. A cheap little flirt. I hope they convict her. Do you really believe she's the reason Sellers broke off your engagement? It wasn't broken off. It was only postponed. <sighs> well, it's like I said, Melba. A lot of surprises. By the way, I'd like to search Betty's room, if you don't mind. That's actually why I came out here. What for? That necklace. I was hired to recover it, remember? But if you think she's innocent, then why do you How bother... How do you know what I think? I haven't really said, have I? No. That's true. That's quite true. <laughs> Lucky shot, Mr. Dollar. You got two on the break. Yeah. Result of a misspent youth. All right. Four ball in the corner pocket. Expert, huh? Oh, just lucky, like you said. Oh, uh, by the way, Mr. Sellers, you were right about Betty. She isn't guilty. She was being framed. I told you so. Yeah, she was just an innocent bystander, you might say. Even though I did find the necklace a few minutes ago, hidden in her room... Found it? Good. The cranes, though, aren't quite so innocent. The cranes? No. Nine ball, the far side pocket. What do you mean about the cranes? They were broke, and they needed money to keep up a front. When you came to town and showed an interest in Melba, they figured you were the answer. Why, you're making Melba sound pretty cold-blooded, you know. Oh, there was no love lost. You were playing the same game. Huh? Sure, Sellers. That's the way you've always operated. Your last wife was a wealthy widow in Miami, Florida. You stayed with her for a year and a half and took her for $150,000. And all that was left of it when you came here was the $20,000 you had invested in the pearl necklace. That was your stake, and that's the way you used it, to convince Melba Crane you weren't a fortune hunter. Twelve ball in the far corner. 
Dollar, where did you get all this information? Police records. Then about a month ago, you broke off your engagement with Melba Crane. Why? Because I was in love with Betty. You were playing Betty for a pigeon. You backed out because you'd finally discovered that the Cranes were flat broke. I wasn't after Melba's money. Sure you were. But you wanted to get out without losing your investment, that necklace. So you brought in Smiley Prell to steal it for you. I never saw Prell in my life. Uncle Phineas saw the two of you together a couple of days after the robbery. Well, he's lying. So Prell pulled the robbery. And then he told you the pearls he'd stolen were phony. You accused him of double-crossing you. He thought you were double-crossing him. Net result, he got sore and tried for a deal with the insurance company. That's why you killed him. Are you accusing me of murder? That's right, Sellers. Eight ball in the end pocket. Who else, Sellers? Betty wasn't in it, except that you tried to frame her. And both the cranes knew the pearls were imitation. You were the only one who didn't. They weren't imitations. I paid $20,000 for that necklace. Not for this one. Melba sold the necklace a month after you gave it to her. They've been living on the money. She had this copy made in Cincinnati. Why, that cheap little crook. So the pearls you kill Smiley for and then planted upstairs in Betty's room are worth about 200 bucks at the most. Something to think about, isn't it? That's right, Dollar. And so is this. Uh Uh-oh. That's a losing game, too, Sellers. It will be for you if you try to make a move. Shoot it out with the police? Is that your answer? If it comes to that. At least I know how to use a gun. Smiley Prell could tell you. Did you steal this one from Uncle Phineas, too? No, no. This one's my own. Now put down that pool cue and get your hands up. Slow and easy. When I go out of here... I'd... Dean, what are you doing with that? Thanks, Melba. Oh. What have you done, Mr. Dollar? Nothing. It's going to make him feel very happy for the next day or so. A pool cue makes a pretty handy weapon. Why? What, what was he doing with that gun? Surprise number one. Your fiancé is the lad who had your necklace stolen and then later killed his partner. Dean! Oh, that's probably the chief of police. He was coming out to meet me. You want to let him in? Murderer. And I was going to marry him. Yeah, I guess murder is a lot worse than fraud. What do you mean? You filed an insurance claim on a necklace you'd already sold. I imagine the company will want to prosecute. I... I didn't know what I was doing. You sure didn't, anywhere along the line. You were marrying Dean Sellers for the money he didn't have. And at the same time, he was trying to marry you for the money you didn't have. (laughs) Too bad it didn't work out. You two were made for each other. The police are getting impatient, Miss Crane. Expense account item 15, $186.25. Incidentals in Cranesburg and transportation back to Hartford. Expense account total, $409.10. End of account, end of report. Under separate cover, I am forwarding one necklace consisting of 38 pearls, all imitation. Approximate value, $200. Along with my sincere condolences. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Here's our star to tell you about next week's story. Next week, the curse of an ancient king and how it affected the lives and deaths of two people. Join us, won't you? Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar, starring Bob Bailey, is transcribed in Hollywood. Written by Les Crutchfield, it is produced and directed by Jack Johnstone. Heard in this week's cast were Howard McNear, Forrest Lewis, Paul Richards, Mary Jane Croft, Virginia Gregg, James McCallion, Shirley Mitchell, and Russ Thorson. Musical supervision by Amerigo Marino. Be sure to join us on Monday night, same time and station, for another exciting story of yours truly, Johnny Dollar, Roy Rowan speaking. <laughs> <laughs>